Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Bramadette, and I'm the director of the Center for Studies in Religion and Society. I'm really pleased to welcome you to the fourth installment of our Values for a New World series. My apologies for the slight delay. We had some trouble getting connectivity worked out properly. Now, in December, we hosted a conversation between award-winning novelist Essie Adugian and award-winning poet Tim Lilburn. That was followed in January by a lecture and conversation about home with Yale theologian Miroslav Wolf. Three weeks ago, we hosted the legendary linguist and political commentator Noam Chomsky. All of our speakers will reconvene on March 16th to tease out some of the overlapping themes that have emerged. We have one more speaker next week, or sorry, uh, later this week, actually, on Thursday. The overarching interest of these conversations has been to reflect together on the moment we're all sharing, a moment in which we can see much more clearly than ever how the crises of climate change, declining trust in democratic norms and institutions, and the COVID-19 pandemic are all part of what we might actually consider a global syndemic. Any imagined future requires us to take seriously the political, legal, scientific, and arguably spiritual crises that grip our world. And in this country, one cannot meaningfully address these matters without addressing Indigenous peoples and perspectives. And so I want to be sure to acknowledge with respect the Lekwungen peoples on whose traditional territory the university stands, and the Songhees, Esquimalt, and Wasanich peoples whose historical relationship to the land continue to this day. Today, our speaker is Thomas Homer Dixon, who is now a neighbor and the founder and director of the Cascade Institute, located at Royal Roads University. Homer Dixon was born in Victoria and after receiving his PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1989, he moved to the University of Toronto to lead several research projects investigating the link between environmental stress and violence in poor countries. While at the U of T, he served as the director of the Trudeau Center for Peace and Conflict Studies. He joined the University of Waterloo in 2008, and between 2009 and 2014, he was a founding director of the Waterloo Institute for Complexity and Innovation. He now holds a university research chair in the Faculty of Environment at the University of Waterloo. In addition to sharing his research in academic journals and publications such as the New York Times, Scientific American, The Walrus, and The Golden Mail, his books include The Upside of Down, Catastrophe, Creativity, and the Renewal of Civilization, The Ingenuity Gap, Environment, Scarcity, and Violence, and most recently, Commanding Hope, The Power We Have to Renew a World in Peril. It's that work that will inspire his remarks and our conversation today. Now, today we're fortunate as well to have four people who will create a digital front row in the virtual town hall discussion we will have after this lecture. With us today are Ian Alexander, master host, media specialist, and my partner at the Anglican Diocese of Islands and Inlets, Katie Stockland from the UVic Philosophy Department, public philosopher Lisa Kretz, and broadcaster and science writer Britt Ray. Their role will be to engage Tad in conversation prior to opening the floor to the broader audience. Speaking of the floor and the format, I should note that on this particular Zoom platform, you're welcome to pose questions in the Q&A section of your screen, and then I will convey those questions to Tad later in the conversation. Once the Q&A period has begun, we will open the chat function and you can respond to one another in the usual way. For those of you who want to revisit the reflections you hear tonight, please know that we will record and make available this video to the public uh, by sometime next week. And before I turn the podium over to Tad, I would like to welcome Ian Alexander to bring the greetings of the diocese. There we are. Thanks, Paul. It's a pleasure for me to bring greetings from the Anglican Diocese of Islands and Inlets of British Columbia on behalf of our new bishop, Anna Greenwood Lee. I believe Anna may be watching this evening. She certainly will be speaking to you herself at our next event in this series, which comes up this Thursday morning. These lectures are a partnership between the diocese and the Center for Studies in Religion and Society at the University of Victoria. They are made possible by a generous endowment from the estate of the late John Albert Hall. He wanted to support the exploration of issues at the boundary, or maybe I should say at the intersection of faith and reason. 
Now, when the pandemic first hit us almost exactly a year ago, our first instinct was to say, well, I guess that means no John Albert Hall lecture this year. But then we realized that actually we could have more John Albert Hall lectures than usual from some of the very best minds from several countries and bring them to many more people than would otherwise be able to attend them in person. And in that way, I guess this series, which we call Values for a New World, is a living example of what today's lecturer, Thomas Homer Dixon, means when he speaks of commanding hope, hope that combines realism and imagination, hope that emerges from necessity and realizes possibility, hope that makes good things happen. Like you, I'm looking forward to what he has to tell us. I'm already feeling hopeful. So without further ado, please welcome Thomas Homer Dixon. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me properly? I think I, think I am now uh, actually connected with you, which is wonderful. Uh, I'm just looking at my clock here. Exactly 40 minutes ago and 12 kilometers away, I found out I had no connectivity. And uh, despite multiple attempts to arrange the connectivity, realized I had to move. So I am uh, <clears throat> I am now in a different location, somewhat less uh, aesthetically pleasing, I guess. But I am with you and delighted to be here this evening. And thanks very much to Paul and Ian for that lovely introduction and uh, for uh, asking me to speak this evening uh, to these very important issues about values in this new world uh, and the challenges that we face as families, as a society, and as a species. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 45 minutes, and uh, I have a fair amount of material, so I'm going to go quite quickly give you an introduction to my fundamental argument of uh, Commanding Hope, the book that I just published six months ago. Uh, but I thought I'd do something a little bit different this evening too, to try to connect the ideas in the book very specifically with uh, the issues of values for a new world. Uh, because uh, this is a, uh, it, it, the book is about hope, and only somewhat indirectly about the kind of values we should adopt for a new world. And it's not something I normally talk about when I'm speaking about the book, but I'm going to emphasize the specific interests of this particular speaker series this evening. So with that as introduction, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen, which means take over all your screens. Let's see if this is going to work. There. Should now have in front of you all of you a uh, title slide for the presentation this evening. So I talk a little bit about uh, the context of this book, and I, I should say that one of the things I'm really delighted about this evening is that we have this. We're going to have a conversation with Brit and Ian and Katie and Lisa, all of whom I'm looking forward to hearing from enormously uh, after I finish speaking. And uh, I think for all of us. Uh, who, who are in this conversation this evening and all of you in the audience, the issue of hope is very personal uh, and very meaningful at a deep emotional level. So I want to talk a little bit about the, the uh, particular context, personal context of this book. Just see here, I seem to have a issue with, there we go. And there's a, there's the, uh, the cover of the book, uh, and I'm delighted if people would go to the uh, website noted at the bottom there and check it out a bit more. Uh, so the context is in part uh, this landscape in British Columbia. I think I'm speaking to many people who are in southern Vancouver Island now or in British Columbia, but perhaps from, uh, to people uh, farther afield too. This is actually the view from the property where I'm located right now, uh, where I've, I've uh, come to from a place where I couldn't have connectivity. This is looking across uh, uh, across the Juan de Fuca Strait towards the Olympic Mountains in uh, Washington, Washington State. Uh, it's an extraordinary environment. It's very much in my bones. And uh, it's where I grew up. 
And this is a property that has been in the family for many decades. And recently the family has come home to this location because uh, my children have spent an enormous amount of time here uh, over the years. Uh, so uh, these are our children, Sarah and my children, Ben uh, standing on the sand there and Kate on my shoulders. This is about 2012 at that point, uh, Ben was uh, about seven and Kate was four. Now Ben is almost turned 16 and Kate is almost turning uh, 13. And uh, I, I started the book at about the time uh, this photograph was taken. So it took me almost eight years to write. And, uh, and, and it was enormously difficult. And I, I did two, uh, I, I had two cracks at the manuscript writing tens of thousands of words, but I had jettisoned them because I just wasn't happy with what I was doing. And about 2016, I realized that the, the issue that gave me the most anguish and the thing that I really needed to, to write about was the possibility that uh, ben and Kate might grow up into a turbulent and potentially violent world and would lose hope. And, and the, that, that just produced enormous anguish, uh, emotional anguish for me. And I realized that more than anything else, I needed to try to craft an argument for why they should and other children and all of us should sustain our hope in what is likely to be an increasingly difficult future. In the book, I... Uh, I talk about the stories we tell ourselves and the stories that we will come to tell ourselves in the future. And the anguish that I have for my children arises from the possibility that they might ultimately tell themselves this story, that we're all members of the failed species. And during this century, the century in which they are going to emerge as adults, we're destined to bear witness to the devastation of our planetary home and the violent unraveling of much of what we've accomplished. And as a parent, anyone who's a parent knows that this is simply unacceptable. We, we, this possibility or possibilities of this kind are not futures that we can, uh, that we can allow to happen or not act to try to prevent uh, that with, with every fiber in our being to try to protect our children. And this future that we, that I fear might arise, uh, described in that previous slide, uh, is possible because of so many enormous stresses humankind seems to be facing right now. Uh, I think it was Paul who talked about a syndemic, or maybe it was Ian. Uh, I tend to call it a polycrisis of simultaneous stresses and challenges that we, we, uh, we are facing as societies, as communities, and as a species as a whole. And in British Columbia, we've seen the vivid evidence of this over the last years in the form of uh, changes in climate patterns that have caused or contributed to a much higher rate of wildfire in, in British Columbia and in the interior of the province especially. Uh, uh, multiple years now, 2015, 2017, 2018, and 2020, uh, there have been smoke events that have saturated the west coast of North America with smoke so dense that that view that I showed you earlier completely disappears and the visibility drops uh, on, on the cliff looking out across the sea there to one or 200 meters. Uh, this was this past, this past September, the fires in Oregon and Washington State and California the accumulated smoke blowing out into the ocean in a huge vortex that you can see there. Later, the wind changed and the smoke blew, blew on shore and across North America and across the Atlantic and eventually girdled the whole northern part of the planet. These are problems, climate change, the smoke, the wildfires, and so many of these problems know no boundaries or borders anymore. They can't be stopped at the at the limits of our of our territory or society uh, prevented from affecting us in one way or the other. And uh, it's not just climate change. Of course, the pandemic has uprooted our lives and and produced such enormous uh, disruption in our societies and our economies, 
in our personal lives over the last the last year. It's almost exactly a year since we were told to lock down. If somebody had asked me in January 20, uh, 2020 uh, what social distancing or what physical distancing meant, I would have not known. But between the middle of March and the middle of April, uh, that concept went global. And within a few weeks, almost 4 billion people on the planet, almost half the world's population was locked down. Never in the history of the human species have we seen such an extraordinary change in human behavior so quickly across such a large proportion of the world's population. And that's something I'm going to come back to later because I think it's actually uh, uh, an unprecedented uh, unprecedented phenomenon that may uh, offer us some hope for the future. Other challenges include massive movements of people around the world trying to escape poverty, uh, violence in their in their own societies, uh, uh, and, and the circumstances of these people are often extraordinarily desperate, uh, and they uh, they end up encamped along the boundaries of wealthy societies where they're treated abysmally, as is the case here in Greece. And then, of course, and not coincidentally, during the pandemic, we've seen an upsurge of protest and uh, and uh, really a, a forceful disagreement with the with the and, and protest against the, uh, the the deep structural imbalances and inequalities within our societies and the and systemic racism affecting uh, visible minorities within our societies and other groups. Uh, these are problems of injustice and inequality that uh, have come to the surface during the pandemic in part because uh, less powerful groups have, in many cases, borne the brunt of the disruption and the pain of the pandemic. So it's not surprising that we've seen uh, these protests arise at this, this point in time. So this, the, the poly crisis or that's endemic, if we want to call it that, consists of many different factors, uh, some of which I've listed here. I'm not going to go through them in detail. I've mentioned a few just over the last few minutes. Uh, uh, in continued human population growth, we're heading to somewhere around 11 billion people on this planet, adding uh, about 70 million people a year still, uh, which contributes uh, through the consumption of the human population and its output of waste to worsening instabilities in key natural systems, such as the Earth, Earth's climate, uh, collapsing biodiversity of uh, large fauna, of, of insect populations, of fish stocks, pandemics of infectious disease, as we're seeing right now. And then within our societies, economic distress arising from technological change, financial shocks, and extreme and growing inequalities of wealth and opportunity, as I've just mentioned. All of these problems can help contribute to rising social polarization and populist authoritarianism and help uh, unravel the fabric of trust and consensus uh, that must underlie anything resembling liberal democracy. This creates a, a situation of chronic fear and uh, my concern for my children is that this is going to be a century that, as these stresses rise and become more serious, will be a wash in fear. Uh, and there are people, of course, who are quite prepared to exploit that fear for their own political gains and for and to try to accumulate power. Uh, Donald Trump may be out of office, but the underlying distemper within U U.S. societies, the the underlying factors that have contributed to his rise have not gone away. And uh, we now have a, a political party, one of two major political parties in the United States that has essentially become an anti-democratic personality cult. It's enormous danger, not just to the United States, but to the world that uh, these forces may uh, come to power again. And these, the, 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 uh, uh, the emotional tenor and the anger and the potential violence that arises from all of these uh, these converging and interacting stresses are expressing themselves all over the planet. We really do face the possibility of a future of an extraordinary division and violence if these 
challenges aren't addressed effectively. So to counterbalance that, one might think that hope would be a, an emotion to espouse, to, to, uh, to put forward as, a, as, a, as an antidote to fear and to anger. But it seems like a pretty weak read in response. And in fact, hope has, uh, has been the subject of a lot of criticism in, uh, in recent years. Uh, it may be regarded as essential to persevering, but it's complex. And it needs to be far more than that hopey, changey thing that Sarah Palin, John McCain's running mate in 2008 against Sarah, Barack Obama, you may remember that uh, Sarah Palin talked about hope, the hope that Barack Obama espoused as a hopey, changey thing. She'd lost the election in 2008, but she went in front of a, a big Republican audience in 2011 and stood in front of them and said, so how's that hopey, changey thing going for you? It was a, a snarky, even a snide comment, but it, 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 it cut to the quick in a way because, because hope uh, seems... Uh, seems weak and passive in response to the kinds of challenges we face. And really my, my project within the book Commanding Hope is to try to uh, make hope more muscular, to try to redefine it and reinvent it in ways that can make it more serviceable for the kind of challenges we face in coming decades. The criticisms of hope tend to fall into these three categories that it's false because it encourages us to engage in wishful thinking, to believe that the, the uh, positive future that we want is more likely than it actually is, uh, that it's naive because we don't, in many cases, hopeful people, the argument goes, don't have a, a clear sense of what that positive future should be. They don't have a clear object for their hope. And fundamentally that it's passive that it, uh, it encourages us to sit back and simply hope that the future we want will come to pass rather than acting to make it come to pass. And these are all powerful critiques and I address them directly in the book. In response to each of these, these specific critiques, I propose an alternative these three components of honest hope, astute hope, and powerful hope, which combine together to make up what I call commanding hope, the reimagined and more muscular kind of hope that I think we need in this challenging world. And for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about each of these, uh, these particular kinds of hope uh, to, give them, to put a bit of flesh on the bones so you can see how I'm thinking of, about honest hope, astute hope, and powerful hope. So let's start uh, with honest hope. There's a deep tension between hope and honesty, especially in dangerous times. And we're now in dangerous times quite clearly. And, in, and those dangerous times encourage us to lie to ourselves, often with the help from our leaders, so that we can pretend it's not that bad. And we see this in particular with climate change. Uh, the, the science, it, for those of you who are following the science closely, you know, you know what I mean. Uh, the, the science is, uh, is very deeply worrying. Uh, and, and the more you know, the bigger the problem seems and the less possibility there seems to be for a future that would be positive for, for our our families, our descendants, and for humanity as a whole. And so the, the response might be to just kind of throw up our hands and walk away and say there's nothing that can be done. Or we tell ourselves that something will arise, a solution will arise, or there will be a technological fix, or maybe the scientists aren't uh, really getting the story right, or maybe there's collusion among the scientists to try to squeeze a lot more research funds out of research agencies, or something that allows us to believe that it's not so bad, but it is bad. And honest hope involves recognizing the reality of our situation. Uh, this is a chart that I present at the beginning of the book. It's one I developed a number of years ago. It's based on the 
on the well-known and somewhat infamous to climate skeptics hockey stick graph. In this case, uh, it goes back much further into the past than the hockey stick graph, basically to the end of the last ice age. This cha chart haunts me. Uh, I think about it all the time. Uh, uh, in, in this case, we're looking at a time span going back to 11,300 years ago. And the red line is the tropospheric temperature of the planet, basically the, the temperature of the surface of the planet up to the present, as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, normalized to zero degrees. That zero, zero degrees actually represents around 13.7 uh, degrees uh, Celsius average across the surface of the planet. But you can see that within that period of time, uh, the temperature, tropospheric temperature has varied about 0.7 uh, degrees in total. And during the last 2000 years, during which humanity laid down the infrastructure of modern human civilization, its agricultural zones, irrigation networks, transportation networks, major cities and the like. During that 2000 years, the temperature varied about 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. And we're now well outside that envelope already. And we're starting to see the consequences in the form of things like wildfires around the planet. But we're going much further. Uh, we're pretty well locked into 1.4 to 1.5 degrees Celsius now, just with the amount of, of uh, carbon that's already entered the atmosphere. Uh, most business as usual scenarios suggest that we're going to uh, exceed two degrees Celsius quite substantially. When we get up towards three degrees Celsius, if we get there by 2100, there's not an ecosystem on the planet that won't be shredded by that change in temperature. Uh, there, aren't, there are no ecosystems that can effectively adapt. Uh, there, uh, there's, it's very hard to imagine, as I was indicating before, how anything resembling liberal democracy would be able to survive in such a disrupted world, in part because it's, it's actually going to be very hard for human, humankind to feed itself in a planet that may be suffer, suffering from repeated droughts in breadbasket regions around the world. And that will be conducive to uh, more authoritarian regimes and potentially a lot of violence between societies. So this, is, has, this has to be part of the reality that we recognize when we try to define our hopes for the future. Uh, and, and it's grim, but uh, uh, we aren't doing ourselves any favor by pretending it's not there. If we're going to try to limit temperatures to two degrees, which is the generally agreed threshold internationally that we want to try to achieve. And by the way, the Paris Accord for, for uh, 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 on, on climate change, if, if all the nations in the world actually uh, do everything that they've said they're going to do, we cap emissions that are, we cap the temperature at around 2.7 degrees, not two degrees. So even the, the best international agreement right now, if everybody abides by it, we aren't getting to where we need to go. And this uh, highlights a, a dilemma that I uh, talk about at some length in the book, what I call the enough versus feasible dilemma, which is that on one hand, the changes that would be enough to make a real difference, say to keep global warming under two degrees Celsius, the major infrastructural changes, the rollout of massive amounts of renewable energy, uh, change in our consumption behavior, dramatic uh, drop, for instance, in the consumption of meat around the world, all those changes that would be enough to make a real difference aren't feasible. They aren't feasible for political reasons, for economic reasons, for technological reasons, or maybe just because they don't seem feasible because people won't change their behavior sufficiently, uh, say, by eating less meat. On the other hand, the changes that are feasible, even if you add them all up, won't be enough to get us to two degrees Celsius. And Honest hope requires that we recognize the profound, uh, the profound tension between enough uh, solutions that might be enough and those that are feasible, and understand and come to grips with the enough versus feasible dilemma, and focus on solutions, that small number of solutions that, be, that may ultimately be both enough and feasible. Here's a funny little cartoon that I found years ago that I... Uh, that you know, in a pithy sort of way points out that uh, changing light bulbs and doing a lot of the other things that we think uh, might help stop the climate problem while they aren't, uh, aren't bad things to do, uh, we shouldn't fool ourselves. 
uh, through dishonest hope that they're anything anything uh, near enough. That's all I'm going to say about honest hope. And I'm going to say a few words about astute hope because most of the, most of the last part of my talk will actually focus on powerful hope because that's where we start talking about the values and the change in values that I think is necessary in our world today. Uh, astute hope uh, is contrasted to naive hope in that it, it has uh, uh, knowledge that allows us to actually try to achieve the better future that we want. It's grounded in, in particular knowledge about the uh, worldviews of others that we might want to work with to try to address problems like climate change or those groups that are blocking possibility of addressing the problem of climate change. And that improved knowledge of of how people are thinking about these issues and what's important to them and what's motivating them uh, can actually help us be much more effective, I would argue, in achieving the ends that we want in creating that world that we hope for. And this perspective is grounded in a distinction between worldviews, institutions, and technologies, what we call WITS, W for worldviews, I is for institutions, T for technologies. Uh, and one of the arguments that we've made in, uh, in my research group at the University of Waterloo and now at Royal Roads University and the Cascade Institute, uh, the Cascade Institute, which I recently founded at Royal Roads University, is that uh, worldviews, institutions, and technologies are tightly coupled together. And if you want to try to change the world in ways that are more positive, you have to work on all three of these things simultaneously. An example of what I mean is the relationship between our commitments to personal liberty, uh, very strong in Western societies, the desire for freedom uh, and liberty, uh, which uh, is reinforced by, that desire is reinforced by and enabled by free markets uh, within our economies. And those free markets in turn create the, the uh, the environment in which the huge industries for the production of private cars can be uh, can thrive and, and private cars can be produced in huge numbers. And those private cars in turn allow us to express our personal liberty in a, in, in a, uh, in a particularly uh, uh, material way by traveling long distances, uh, going to places anytime we want, basically, in our private cars. So there's a relationship between the worldview commitment to personal liberty, the institutional commitment to free markets, and the technological commitment to private cars. And if we want to get people out of their private cars, we actually have to think about adjustments in the other areas too. But I make a pitch in the book for focusing on worldviews specifically. And, and uh, I highlight the importance of trying to change uh, people's perspectives on the world, change our own perspectives on the world, uh, and change potentially other people's perspectives on the world, and especially understand how other people are thinking about the world when it comes to problems like climate change or the underlying values that motivate them to consume and live in particular ways. So the last part of the book is very much a fo focused on worldview change, and I introduce a couple of uh, methods that I think anyone can use to try to better understand how worldviews work. One of them is called cognitive effective maps. And uh, these are maps where you take a, uh, a set of concepts from an individual and represent them by linking the concepts together. So for instance, if you really don't like climate change, it might be in a little hexagon, gray hexagon, uh, surrounded by a thick black line, that's a strongly negative concept. If you are very strongly positive towards the concept of democracy, you might put it. You would put it within a a uh, uh, an oval with a thick black line, a strongly positive concept at the top. And you can create maps of people's concepts. I'll show you a couple in a few minutes, uh, where you link a bunch of concepts together with particular kinds of links, dashed and dotted links that represent particular relationships between the concepts and allows you to see much more specifically how people are thinking about the world and uh, reacting to it emotionally. And this kind of knowledge I say is, I, I say in the book is a really important component of what I call astute hope. But let's go on to 
powerful hope because I think this is the one that engages most directly with the issue of values for a new world. The powerful hope is one that has uh, a clear object uh, in the sense that it has a vision of the future towards which it directs itself. And it engages with that vision of the future in a very uh, agential or active way. So it's a kind of hope that is more than a hope that a future that you want will come to pass. Rather, it's a hope to make that future possible. Uh, so for instance, rather than hoping that passively, hoping that uh, we can cap warming on the planet to two degrees, we ask ourselves, how, what is my hope to actually uh, do things to keep that warming to two degrees, to make sure it doesn't exceed two degrees? Adding hope insists that hope has a clear vision of a desirable future. There's a debate in the philosophical and the psychological literature over the extent to which hope has to be intentional in the sense that it has to have a, a clearly defined object. I make a strong argument in the book that uh, anything that's going to, uh, any kind of hope that's going to really engage our sense of agency and give us a sense of positive possibility for the future, uh, that's going to motivate us to to strive and persevere in dif difficult times, we'll have to have a clearly defined object or vision of the future around which not just we can rally, but peoples potentially around the world can rally. So what would that vision of the future be? I, I suggest three injunctions that are a starting point, but insufficient in themselves as a, as a, uh, as a, as a foundation for a vision of the future, but just a starting point. Three injunctions that potentially we can all agree on all over the planet between diverse civilizations and societies. Don't wreck our planetary home. Don't commit mass suicide by fighting among ourselves and protect our children. This is like a floor for me uh, of, uh, of the, the basic principles that we should really reasonably easily agree to uh, as a starting point for defining our vision of the future, but they're insufficient in themselves, in part because the first two are negative injunctions. Uh, and they don't, any, any negative injunction like that is, is not, uh, not, one, not something that's going to inspire people and give them a strong sense of motivation uh, to, uh, to achieve change. We need more. We are in an unprecedented situation now. And one of the things that that gives me hope, so I'll stress this point over the next few minutes, is that, uh, uh, is that things are, are profoundly different from any time previously in human history. And there are three aspects to that unprecedented situation that need to be highlighted. The first, which I'm going to talk about uh, a fair amount in the next few minutes, is an arising awareness of common fate uh, uh, and the potential vulnerability, shared vulnerability we have on this planet. I think one of the things that the pandemic has done is it's been a it's been a, a blow in the gut for people all around the planet. Not only has it been a very visceral lesson in the reality of system flips or sharp non-linearities, that change is sometimes not incremental and sometimes the sharp shifts in behavior of the systems that we depend upon uh, can, can hurt us enormously. Uh, but it's also, I think, reinforced our awareness of common fate, that we're on a small planet together, as I'll highlight in a moment, uh, and that we are either going to survive together or we're going to die together. And, and that's a particularly acute problem with climate change. We're also, of course, and this is trivial almost these days, hyper-connected together. In, but that is, that level of connectivity, even with the kind of deglobalization that we're seeing to a certain extent now, is still unprecedented and extraordinary. And the other thing that's, that's unprecedented about the situation today is the enormous amount of scientific knowledge that we have, even though it might be rejected by some minority groups, uh, some minorities in our population. But nonetheless, we have an enormous amount of scientific knowledge about the nature of the challenges we face. In contrast to, say, the Black Death during uh, in early modern Europe, where uh, societies didn't really have 
a good understanding of the nature of the challenge they were facing, the pandemic they were facing. Uh, our response to the current pandemic, uh, scientific response has been absolutely breathtakingly fast and very effective when you think of the speed with which the for instance, vaccines have been developed and are starting to be distributed around the world. We have a very good understanding of the nature of this climate change challenge we face. Uh, again, unlike previous societies that were overwhelmed by, uh, by challenges they didn't understand at all. So these three characteristics, uh, emerging awareness of common fate, the hyperconnectivity among us, and the abundant scientific knowledge that's available to us to understand exactly what's happening are all, uh, are all uh, together, when you combine them together, that creates a truly unusual situation on this planet. The possibility, I would say, for uh, a very uh, substantial jump in human consciousness and human understanding of this predicament and action to uh, improve its predicament. Let me speak for a few moments about this issue of common fate. Uh, uh, I talked earlier in, in the presentation about the the shift that hurt happened between mid March and mid April of this year, when uh, uh, um, almost half the human population locked down, and the concept of social distancing or physical distancing spread like wildfire around the planet, affected people's behavior all over the planet. There is this sense that we're uh, very crowded in a very small place now. I think that's something that we're increasingly aware of. One of the things that I think may emerge from uh, this pandemic is uh, something equivalent roughly to a, a, an immune system for the entire planet. Uh, it doesn't look like the coronavirus is going to go away anytime soon, and it's mutating very fast as we see. But the way we're going to respond to those variants as they develop is we're going to have a global network of uh, genomic sequencing stations, and we're going to track the changes as they arise and adjust, as we do with, for instance, the flu vaccine, adjust the vaccines in real time as, uh, as, uh, as variants, new variants appear. And in some, in some in rough analogy, this is similar to the kind of immune system, say a, a mammalian body has a mammal's body with its macrophages and its T cells and its white blood cells and its antibodies responding very fast to diverse pathogens that affect it. This is a, I think a really fundamental shift in uh, uh, or, or a further push to the recognition that we, we need to work together to solve our problems. It's not guaranteed by any means in a world of rising fear that this pressure towards solidarity will, will uh, prevail. But nonetheless, uh, there are very strong incentives for us to learn to work together to solve problems like the pandemic and ultimately like climate change. I often get asked by by folks uh, when we talk about the climate change problem, the, the question, where can we go? Usually, where can my family go? Uh, as in, where can my family go or where can I go when things start to fall apart? And my answer is nowhere. We, there's actually nowhere on the planet that's not going to be profoundly and irreversibly affected by problems like climate change. I, I just want to take a, you know, a little... Uh, detour here, because uh, the rover Perseverance uh, landed on Mars the other day, not long ago, and it's an incredible piece of scientific, uh, uh, incredible scientific adventure and an incredible piece of, uh, uh, or example of scientific innovation. Extraordinary accomplishment, one that I, I admire in many respects, and, uh, and I'm a supporter of the program overall. But it's been accompanied by a conversation about the possibility of humankind moving itself substantially to Mars, like we've made a mess out of Earth, so let's go to Mars. And people like uh, Jeff Bezos and, and uh, Elon Musk are, of course, at the forefront of this conversation. This is a photograph from the Perseverance rover just uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, uh, we have to remember that Mars is, at, at best, vastly more inhospitable been the most inhospitable places on, on Earth. That would include the coldest parts of Antarctica and the hottest parts of Death Valley in the United States. This is not a place where it makes sense for us to go to build a home because we've wrecked our home. 
even if we can do it in enormous numbers that would make a difference to the population pressures on earth. Uh, my guess is that very few people would be able to survive psychologically there. This is a photograph from the Curiosity rover of Earth on January 31st, 2014 from Mars. That's Earth, enlarged for your benefit in the little black rectangle there. My guess is that the people who go to Mars and find that they can't go home will suffer absolutely devastating psychological harm. It would be a miserable place to be. To realize this awareness of common fate, we need to uh, find another kind of superordinate goal. Uh, I talk about superordinate goals in, in the book at some length. These are goals that draw all of humankind together because we understand that we can only achieve them by working together. And out of that, and out of that cooperation to achieve these goals, we develop a sense of common purpose and common identity, a planetary sense of planetary weeness, if you will. And that and the project of going to Mars is not one that's going to uh, act as a superordinate goal that will help bind us together even if it were possible. So I talk about the principles around which we need to build this vision of the future and the superordinate goal that I think is most likely one that could help bring us, uh, bring this sense of shared fate to fruition on the planet. I'm not gonna talk about these principles in detail, but in, in the book, I discuss security, opportunity, justice, and identity in some detail at the end of, at the, end of the book. These are sort of what I might call the value pillars on which the, the thicker vision of the future that I articulate uh, is founded. Uh, a, a vision of the future I call the renew the future worldview. Uh, I came up with the, these particular values and I argue in a, bit, in a bit of detail for a particular notion of security, a particular notion of opportunity, a particular notion of justice. And then I talked already over the last few minutes about uh, the, the sense of common identity on the planet, the shared sense of weeness. I talk, I talk about uh, or identify these, the first three in particular, security and opportunity and, opportunity and justice, uh, based on my observations of what I think are dominant temperaments in human beings, having traveled and studied in many societies around the world, uh, I'm, I'm struck by how, to an interesting extent, you can sort people into roughly three categories, what I would call the exuberant temperament, the prudential temperament, or prudent temperament, and the empathetic temperament. Exuberant people have this uh, a, a tremendous sense of joy about life, and their principal aspiration is opportunity and the, the, the uh, exercising of the agency that thrills them, the sense of possibility for flourishing. Prudential, uh, prudential people are much more concerned about danger in the world and uh, their principal aspiration is security or safety. And empathetic people have an enormous sense of uh, sympathy and, and compassion for others and their principal aspirations are justice and fairness. So to go back to the four principles on which I think this vision of the future have to be founded, if we want to bring as many people from societies around the world together around a vision of the future that humanity can share, we need to have principles that speak to these three temperaments. Uh, the principle of security for the prudential temperament, the principle of opportunity for the exuberant, exuberant temperament, and the principle of justice for the empathetic temperament. Uh, and, and generally, ideological perspectives that we see dominant in the world today will speak to one or two of these communities, not all three. And, uh, and I think that as we, as we uh, try to consciously design ideas for how we're going to live together on this planet and the kind of larger political and social ideology that will bring us together, we need to think in terms of the different characteristics of the human beings in terms of their temperaments who will make up our community. And the superordinate goal that I suggest is the one of rebuilding nature, of creating opportunity and possibility for nature to flourish again on this planet. Uh, and, uh, and, 
and applying humanity's extraordinary ingenuity and capacity for innovation to the challenge not of exploiting nature, but of creating space for nature to flourish. So in the last few minutes, I'm almost finished my 45 minutes here, uh, my presentation. Let me contrast uh, a couple of perspectives on the future. Uh, in the last chapter of the book, I contrast these worldviews of fear and hope, what I call the Mad Max worldview versus the renew the future worldview. And I use cognitive effective maps to actually try to uh, uh, tease apart some of the underlying emotional components and and uh, characteristics of these two perspectives. The Mad Max worldview is one that is very much already uh, emerging around the planet and is, and is strong in certain communities. Uh, it's a kind of perspective that I think the populist authoritarianism of people like Donald Trump uh, thrives within and tries to promote. Uh, this is a photograph from Mad Max Fury Road for those of you who are Mad Max aficionados. And again, I use the cognitive effect of maps to actually represent the, the uh, underlying conceptual structure of uh, these two worldviews, perspectives on the future. Here, for the Mad Max worldview, the future is surrounded by negative concepts of danger, decline, scarcity, loss, the enemy. And positive concepts on the right-hand side are are all uh, focused on the the of protecting the in group, protecting our we, building boundaries and and securing our territory, perhaps through violence against those outside dangers, to uh, keep ourselves safe. The renew the future worldview that I propose is, has an entirely different conception of the future. It's one that is linked to these concepts of opportunity, safety, and justice, and, and uh, the global we that I've talked about before, those four principles of opportunity, safety, justice, and identity. Uh, there is this, the, the powerful goal, superordinate goal of rebuilding nature. And all of these things together uh, combine to support a positive vision of the future. And, uh, and those, in turn, are protected from the dangers, the emotional dangers on the left-hand side by this very strong and powerful sense of hope that we have to create that possible future. So it's an entirely different perspective, an emotional orientation, conceptual orientation, worldview, entirely different worldview with respect to the future and possibilities for the future. We need to reach a social tipping point before we reach a planetary one. And in my closing words, let me just say a little bit about how I think this might be possible. The question then is, are we on the cusp of what Carl Jaspers called the axial age, which was a, a Carl Jaspers, the great German existential philosopher in the 20th century, talked about the, the uh, uh, talked about the the axial age, a period of time he identified between about 600 BCE and 200 BCE, during which five civilizations around the world, civilizations that weren't actually communicating very much with each other, all went through a simultaneous shift in their cosmologies that laid the groundwork, the conceptual and ethical groundwork for modernity. And I think even the unprecedented situation we're facing right now, we may be on the cusp of a very similar kind of uh, flip in humankind's conception of itself, conception of its relationship to nature uh, that uh, could produce potentially very positive outcomes going forward. I think there is opportunity for trying to expand the set of feasible solutions through our imaginations so that we can increase the overlap between the set of feasible solutions and those solutions that are enough so that we can find more possibilities for solving the enough versus feasible dilemma. In the book, I talk about uh, two stories, one at length, the story of Stephanie May, a Connecticut housewife who uh, was, became very concerned in the 1950s about the explosion of nuclear weapons by the United States and the Soviet Union and the atmosphere and the radioactivity that was spreading around the planet. And she started working at, 
and, and basically at her kitchen table, uh, developing petitions, circulating petitions, phoning people, working with a, another housewife in her community to try to mobilize mothers in her community to uh, protest the testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Stephanie worked hard uh, to learn her hope was very honest, worked hard to learn as much as she could about the, the technologies, the politics, uh, the possibilities for change, the obstacles to, for change. And she, within a few years, she managed to, she was instrumental in mobilizing uh, thousands, tens of thousands of mothers across the United States and ultimately around the world to, uh, uh, to achieve uh, restriction on the use of nuclear weapons, explosion of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. Here she is protesting in front of the Russian mission to the United Nations. I think this is about 1961. And uh, here in 1961, she's speaking to 100,000 people in Trafalgar Square. This, the, the, the story of Stephanie is fascinating. I was very fortunate to, to have her memoirs and her scrapbooks, which allowed me to really understand the kind of hope that motivated her. And her story goes through the entire book. Uh, and uh, that little girl standing beside Stephanie there in Trafalgar Square is Elizabeth May, who in, uh, later became, of course, the leader of the Green Party in Canada. So Stephanie, uh, along with mothers around the world, uh, were instrumental in pushing the United States and the Soviet Union to agree to the partial test ban treaty in 1963, which stopped testing of nuclear weapons in the atmosphere. And uh, very rapidly after that, uh, radioactivity in the atmosphere fell back to normal levels. If on January, excuse me, on August the 18th, uh, 2018, somebody had said that a young girl uh, of 15 or so would be sitting on the on the front of the steps of the Swedish parliament building with a sign written in Swedish saying school strike for climate and that she would mobilize uh, tens if not hundreds of millions of people around the world to demand action on climate change and fundamentally change the debate around the world on climate issues. We would have said on August the 18th that that was a ridiculous idea, but there is Greta Thunberg on August the 19th, 2018, uh, beginning beginning that protest. Uh, this was something that was invisible to us as a possibility at the time. We didn't really imagine it. And we couldn't have imagined it, most of us, because we, and we would have said that it was a crazy idea. But Stephanie, excuse me, but uh, Greta Thunberg uh, took that possibility from what complexity scientists call the adjacent possible, uh, in, which was invisible to us, and pulled it into reality and made it possible and made it real. Virtuous cascades of change need to start in our minds, and then they become political. The challenges that Stephanie and Greta have, have confronted in their lives are profoundly political challenges. They require addressing power imbalances and structures of, of uh, wealth and opportunity within our societies to bring about change. But that, that change needs to begin in our minds with changing the way we think about things and what we believe and what we value. I close the book with this, with these, uh, these two sentences here, which brings us back to the enough versus feasible dilemma. Let's not aim, I say, for what's merely feasible and falsely hope it will be enough. Instead, with commanding hope, let's aim for what we'd all consider enough, a future in which our children and life on this planet can flourish, and then strive to make that future our reality. Thank you very much. I will stop sharing now and look forward to the conversation that we're going to have over the next half hour or so. Thanks very much, Thomas. That was really uh, great. I really appreciate your insights. So uh, our hope now is to have a conversation among about four or five of us uh, that in some sense seeds the broader conversation we want to have as a larger community and that we'll have uh, ongoing actually. So let's begin with Ian Alexander from the Anglican Diocese of Islands and Inlets. Thanks Paul and uh, thank you very much uh, Tad if I may call you that uh, as I Absolutely. hear people do. 
Um, as mentioned, I'm the rep of the Anglican Diocese, so my question may not surprise you, but I noticed that it also echoes one that's already popped up in the in the Q&A. So as I was sitting looking out over Juan de Fuca Strait to the Olympic Peninsula, reading your book here in View Royal and tonight listening to you, I often heard in my mind's ear um, some words from the biblical letter to the Hebrews, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And I know you've described yourself as not a religious person, at least in the conventional sense, but you've also said uh, in the book, I think you say that our motivation to persevere through the difficult times ahead will likely derive in part from an explicitly spiritual connection with the sacredness of life and nature. And yesterday on CBC, you, you called for a global, global spiritual shift, I think were the words. But then you said, but not one connected with formal religious doctrine or dogma or denomination. So my question is, what contribution, if any, do you think that established religious institutions and faith traditions, Christian or otherwise, can or might or should make to this commanding hope project. Thanks, Ian. An enormous contribution, Ian. I, 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 and I don't want anything I've said either in the book or yesterday or today to suggest that uh, that there isn't a central role for conventional religion in this process of of uh, worldview renewal, which is fundamentally a spiritual process. I, I get, as you know, to those issues. Uh, most directly in the last pages of the book where I talk about the sacredness or the possibility of creating opportunity for nature to flourish. And uh, I quote uh, Stuart Kaufman, the complexity scientist, saying that when you look at, at what life does, he says, that's God enough for me. You know, And it may not be God enough for most people, but uh, I'm a complexity scientist at, uh, at, at core. Uh, I apply complex systems theories to the world's problems. I do so in this particular book I have in my previous books. And one of the things I find about the complexity of the world is that it's emancipatory. It gives the sense of flourishing and possibility and novelty, which I find enormously exciting. Uh, and, and in that complexity is uncertainty. And the uncertainty actually gives us reason for hope because we can't know everything about the future and all the possibilities. For me, this is, a, this is, this is what I would call a, a, a spiritual orientation towards the world. It, 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 uh, it doesn't involve particular commitments to the soul or to a particular deity, but it, it's certainly grounded in those, in, the, in those profound emotions of awe and wonder that, uh, that I think are common to all spiritual people. So that's, so, uh, this has to be a pluralistic project, whatever it's going to look like. It needs to bring all of the, of the the religions together around the world so that they can see their own possibilities within this project. Otherwise, we're we're, we're doomed. But all of those all of those religions are expressing a human potential and a, and a, a a sense of of uh, uh, that there's more in the universe than science can, in a narrow sense, can give us. That I think is really important. Uh, it gives us, and the other thing, one of the other concepts I didn't mention that I think is very important is this notion of hero projects. That one of the reasons, one of the ways we we survive psychologically as individuals is the sense that we have a, a purpose, a meaning as individuals or in our communities on this world. And religion is very important for instilling that sense of purpose. Uh, so I I see these, there are... I guess where I would draw the boundary is with the religions that are highly exclusionary, that say ours is the right way, yours is wrong, uh, and and then ultimately that can become a dehumanization process. For all the rest, I I would say let's start the conversation and figure out how we're going to develop this new notion of spirituality together. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. So uh, Katie Stockland from the UVic Philosophy Department. Thank you. Thank you very much for this talk. It's been super interesting. Um, and I have a lot of things I want to ask you, but I'll contain myself and be focused. Um, so I think it's super lovely that you were motivated to think and write about hope by considering what the future could be like for your children. I always love um, 
hearing what motivates people to get into certain projects. And I think that provides a super helpful lens for kind of framing the project and where it, where it can go. But you also showed us photos of refugees and Black Americans. And I'm not sure. Um, so I'm not sure that they, I'm wondering if your argument can speak to all of us, if, if it can speak to your children, but it can also speak to refugees and Black Americans and the people who are disproportionately bearing the burden of climate change and um, the pandemic and violence and war and all of these awful things that might threaten hope for many of us. Um, it seems like you want to suggest that we should hope, but I guess I just want to know who is the we? Who is the we? Yep. Who is the we here? Is it all of us? Um, is it some of us? Do some of us get to be a part of a collective future because it's plausible that we will survive into that future, whereas others won't? So I'm wondering if you can speak more to human difference. Sure. So in the book, I actually ask exactly that question. And in, in towards the end of one of the early chapters, I say the we I speak of in this book is all of humanity. Uh, I, you know, honestly, Katie, I think that if we if if we uh, if we start from the premise that there are going to be some communities excluded from these possibilities, then we're not going to succeed. It's as simple as that. So uh, so that issue comes up repeatedly through the book, and uh, it comes up in my discussion of power around halfway through the book and how power expresses itself to exclude certain communities. It comes up towards the end of the book when I'm talking about issues of justice and what justice means and how contentious that is. Uh, and I, I slight digression in some of the theories of justice, which I can't get into in detail in, in the book. But fundamentally, this notion of a, a shared commitment to the commonweal has to include everybody. It has to include everybody. You know, we can think that some people can think that they can go and retreat into their own gated community, their own place. It's sort of, a, you know, in answer to that question, where can I go or where can we go? You know, we have these folks heading off to New Zealand, uh, billionaires building their own airstrips and, and retreats down in New Zealand. Uh, apparently, these conversations have become much more vigorous so, since uh, with the pandemic, but, if, but they were already, uh, there was lots of this stuff going on because people were concerned about social instability, political instability, climate change, leading to social breakdown and societal breakdown. But, you know, what's going to happen? They, they get on their plane, they fly there. Are they, going to take, are they going to take their mechanic with them? Are they going to take the mechanic's family? Are they going to take the, the doctor and their doctor's family? I mean, you can't, in our world, you can't actually isolate yourself ultimately. And I think one of the lessons of the pandemic is that if we're going to deal with this thing, coronavirus effectively, uh, these vaccines need to be rolled out around the entire planet. We need to respond quickly to the development of mutations wherever they appear in the planet. And the kinds of imbalances, power and wealth imbalances we're seeing are actually tearing our societies apart. There's a, you know, lots of analysis in the United States of the rise of Trumpism and the kind of, and, and a really debilitating uh, uh, reactionary right-wing ideologies in the United States, the denial of, of, of uh, basic scientific facts, uh, uh, anti-democratic movements, that this is profoundly influenced by, by the inequalities of wealth and opportunity within the society. And as those inequalities get worse, uh, the, the, uh, the increasing force of these underlying divisive ideologies you know, those ideologies will increase in force. So, you, you know, we either have to, we, we as all of us, either have to start under seeing ourselves as together on this planet, or we're going to fall apart, divided, and end up fighting. And the chances of us fighting each other are extraordinarily high now, right? The chances that this that this is going to be an extraordinary, a really violent century as we get further into it are very high. I started my work on the relationship between environmental stress and violence in societies. That's where I did my first work after I finished my doctorate. Everything that we studied at that time is now starting to come to pass in much more ferocious form than we've seen up to this, at this point. And it's going to get worse going, going forward into the future. So, so the we, there's only, there's only one we we can talk about. And, and, I'm, and I try to be as explicit as possible about that. So, you know, for the refugees and the Black Lives, the, 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 the folks who are mobilized around Black Lives Matter and those and the indigenous communities, uh, it, it's, 
it, we're all in the same boat, ultimately. There's no alternative here, Katie, and this is where the rubber meets the road, to very significant transfers of wealth and power between communities within the world. And there are, and part of the prospect for violence in the future is that they're going to be groups that resist that with everything that they have available to them. But there's no, there's no route out of, there's no route towards solving the climate problem that doesn't involve a redressing fundamentally of these power and wealth imbalances within and between our societies. It's either going to happen peacefully or it's going to happen violently. Thanks very much, Katie. Uh, Lisa Kretz. Yeah, I'd like to echo Katie. Thank you so much for this talk and the conversation that it's prompting. Uh, I myself am a very pragmatic philosopher. I'm really interested in the theory action gap. So I was delighted to hear about the focus on future generations because when it comes to environmental action, that's one of the um, motivators that will prompt people to actually act, not just talk about it, um, future, future generations. So it's very motivating. Um, so what I wanted to circle in on is uh, the topic of imagination. So you noted that uh, hope is subject to a lot of criticism. Part of it is lacking a, a clear object for hope. And imagination can help us create those clear objects for hope. And I'm thinking of the work of Adrian Marie Brown, who in Emergent Strategy, so uh, Brown is a queer um, Black activist in Detroit. Um, who talks about effective action in emergent strategy and actually has workshops on imagination um, and talks about uh, sort of Afro-futurist writing and how that sci-fi writing really inspires people to think outside the box. Um, and I'm also thinking of Ken Robinson uh, and yeah. what he said about imagination, namely that we crush children's imagination uh, in the Western paradigm. Um, so we're working against that skill. So yes. I... Given Katie's concerns about multiple positions that folks have in relationship to depression, how do you how do you envision um, best growing hope via imagination? So uh, there must be hundreds and hundreds of mentions of imagination through the book, and I, I have a whole central chapter where I talk about the relationship between imagination, uncertainty, uh, time, and hope. Uh, so, so now I have to, I have to caveat all of that with saying uh, I'm not, I'm I'm not an expert in imagination. So I will defer to others who are and who've studied it for a long period of time. But there's this capacity we have to take what we know as human beings, to take what we know and 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 divide it up into sort of little bits, and then recombine them in ways in new forms to create. Uh, a vision of what's possible in the future. Uh, this is a, we have a recursive mind. We can think about ourselves in the future. We can think about ourselves thinking in the future. We can imagine ourselves thinking and imagining in the future uh, um, by taking what we know of the world and recombining it. It's actually very difficult for us to, to uh, in, in some sense, what we know about the world today is the alpha that we use. It's the letters that we use to create new possibilities in our minds for the future. It's one of the reasons that, such a, that so much science fiction, when we go back and look at it years later, seems so, you know, so bizarre and so odd and so sort of anachronistic because they had to work with what they had at the time. And what we actually find is this kind of explosive unfolding of possibility of things that we haven't imagined before. We can do the best we can to try to perceive those possibilities, but many of them we won't be able to proceed because they're so different from what we're experiencing today. It's interesting you mentioned Kim Stanley Robinson because I, I have his book. We've actually been exchanging notes and uh, we've exchanged signed books. And, uh, and, and uh, I think he's one of the best examples. I haven't started reading the book yet, uh, Ministry for the Future, but it's one of the best examples of somebody who's applied uh, their imagination as effectively as possible to seeing a way forward, positive way forward. So, you know, I have to, and this goes in some response in part to the previous question, I have to, you know, be very conscious of my own lived experience and who I am as an individual, the communities I've come from, my skin color, and the, and the, and the advantages and possibilities those have given me and what I can't see and even might not even be able to imagine in these other communities. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I come back to the point and I make this point several times in the book that that we're profoundly more similar than we are different 
And we need to draw on those similarities and the empathy as part of that empathetic temperament I'm talking about that allow, would allow us to, uh, to solve these problems together. And, and the tough part and the on, part of the honest hope for those communities, such as those I live within that have benefited from these power relations in the past, is that we have to acknowledge that we're going to have to give stuff up. We're going to have to share more. We're going to have to, there's going to be a, as I said at the end of my last point, there's going to be a transfer of wealth and opportunity within the world. It's either going to have happen voluntarily or it's going to happen violently. And, uh, uh, and, and I think those of us who have benefited from the current structural relationships in our societies have to be honest about uh, the fact that that's coming. And uh, uh, so I, the other part is that we need to listen a lot and try to understand as much as possible the perspectives of the other groups. But but where we end up ultimately is probably going to be very different from that from from anything that any of our communities can imagine right now. We can try to explore that adjacent possible and move ourselves into a new world with some kind of direction. But the uncertainties of the future offer all kinds of opportunities that we can't even envision now. I use Gandalf. I, I talk about the Lord of the Rings in the book. I have a whole section on the Lord of the Rings. The, the wizard Gandalf said, uh, despair is only for those who cannot, who, who, who see the future without doubt, or without question. I think he said, we do not. Mm-hmm. We, have, we don't have the certainty that allows us to be hopeless. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Brent. Hi, Tad. It's great to see you, and thank you for a really wonderful talk. I have so many questions I want to ask you, and I'm having a hard time paring it down. But since we've thoroughly gone into the concept of weeness, I'll go to my backup question. Um, <laughs> some of my co-panelists here have already asked you what I wanted to talk to you about. Okay, so now the hope of your commanding hope is that in practice, it might result in us jumping towards positive worldviews for hundreds of millions to billions of people within a pretty short amount of time, which I would characterize as an unlikely hope, even if it is possible. And you say that we must do this if we're going to be effective in reducing the risk we face of descending into savage violence across the globe. Now, given that the human brain has a negativity bias, which is just an evolutionary adaptation for purposes of survival. And by that, I mean, we're programmed more or less to focus on threats and fears, while we don't often ruminate on the positive experiences that we have. This task is therefore very daunting. To me, this all spells out an urgent need for emotional intelligence in how we relate to each other as we try to shape a better society now, which your work clearly backs up. So I'm wondering, what do you think are the most crucial tools in the emotional intelligence toolkit for our capacity to preserve a good future? And what can we do as individuals to practice them? Mm -hmm. Well, I challenge one of the things you said at the beginning, Britt, we can have a, uh, I should tell folks, Britt and I have had a conversation going on for a while. we can have an offline conversation about this ultimately, but but you know a lot of psychologists would say that human beings are actually they actually have an optimism bias that they tend to that that uh, uh, they tend to see things more positively and positive likelihood and and positive outcomes as more likely than they actually are in the real world. And there's been research on the fact the fact that depressives are actually have a more realistic often have a more realistic understanding of the of the of the uh, uh, likelihood of various eventualities in the future, um, uh, but I think I take what you're saying, a more general point. I take it completely seriously that that uh, this transformation that I'm saying must come. It seems to be extraordinarily unlikely. Uh, um, uh, but uh, there's so many things that are happening in our world now that we would have we wouldn't have imagined possible like uh, you know in 2011 if somebody had said president there was going to be president trump right we're going to have pre- we're going to have president donald trump is going to be president of the united states that would have seemed like a completely ludicrous statement uh if uh, uh you know there were epidemiologists talking about the possibilities of pandemics but uh very few people took that reality seriously or realized what it would mean or imagined what it would mean in our everyday lives. So we're living in worlds and climate change now is starting to do things that 
people uh, weren't able to wrap their minds around just even just a few years ago. So we're already living in a world that seems to be transforming itself in ways that for many people were almost unimaginable. Uh, and I think that that creates a lot of fear. Uh, it, one the thing that you hear all the time now in societies around the world is when are things going to go back to normal? When are we get, when when will things be normal? Well, there isn't going to be any normal. That vertical line on that on that temperature graph means that we're packing more and more energy into the ocean atmospheric system on the planet, which is going to keep driving us to, to, uh, through through a series of equilibria of climate equilibria that will be increasingly extreme as we go forward in the future. There's there there's no normal anymore, uh, and uh, you know there's every possibility that. Uh, in four years, we'll have a return of reactionary politics to the presidency in the United States. So, so what do we need? I just, I think, you know, I, I would say that you're absolutely right that the probability of the kind of change and transformation in a positive direction that I talk about in the book is actually quite low, right? When when young people come up to you in my presentations and say, so what's the chance that by 2100 there will be a humane world, a humane civilization on this planet? I say, well, you know, speaking crudely, defining your categories in a somewhat arbitrary way, what, 20% maybe? And it's interesting how they react. It may not be 20%. It might be 10. It might be 2. But I think the reaction would be the same. It's, okay, we can shoot for 20 it's like we will we will take that possibility, try to bend it in our favor, and 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 see if we can if we can uh, if we can achieve that positive outcome. So the interesting thing about hope is that it doesn't require, and maybe this is part of your answer to the emotional intelligence thing. Hope, you can hope, and you can hope honestly and realistically, and with a lot of agency, even if you know that the probability of your positive outcome is actually very low. People who are terminally ill. With, with cancer, for instance, or facing death from cancer, and they're told that they have a 5% chance, will do everything they can to strive for that 5%. Well, I think, you know, we may be looking at probabilities above like that. Um, but that's good enough. If that's what we got, let's see what we can do with it. So, so that's part of the emotional intelligence. And then there would be other components, I think, obviously, that the, the need for empathy is enormous here. The, the capacity which I try to cultivate or provide tools for cultivation to be able to see into other people's worldviews, to acknowledge that one's own perspective is arbitrary and constrained, informed by context, and that one has to has to, to step outside. You know, Don Alla Meadows says that the greatest power is the ability to transcend paradigms, to transcend worldviews, to be able to step outside one's own perspective and see the world from other perspectives. That's a that's a capacity I try. I, I try to provide some tools to people to enable that capacity in the book, the cognitive effective mapping and some other tools. Uh, that's, that's part of what I would regard as emotional intelligence, uh, that we need to be astute in our hope, to have the right kinds of knowledge to be hopeful effectively. Those, those would be a couple of possibilities. I'm sure if I reflected, I would say that there's a broader toolkit in terms of the emotional intelligence that we need. But those are two that I think are particularly important. Thanks very much, Thank Ted. You. So we don't have a lot of time left. We started a little bit late, so I'll think I'll, I'll indulge the audience and, and hope for us to stay for another five minutes. But uh, we have quite a few very good questions in the chat section. I'm just going to see how we can uh, how we can do with the time. Stuart Culbertson uh, asks, if you had to rewrite Commanding Hope for in February 2021 from a now fuller perspective of our COVID experience, has COVID been a cautionary tale or an optimistic example of hope in action? Huh, so that's interesting. So actually, it was rewritten. Uh, so uh, the book was all all done, and it was in page proofs in March last year. And uh, and then you know the world shut down basically. And by April, I realized uh, that the book wasn't speaking to the moment. So I went back to my publisher and and my editor. And they opened up the space for me to essentially rework the book from the very first sentence to the last, uh, inserting, inserting places and comments where I could connect the book specifically to, to the challenges of the pandemic. And I actually think that as a result, the book still speaks very effectively to what we've been through uh, and, and what we're going to be emerging to, into as we, as we leave the pandemic. Um, 
I would say, though, to come back to the points that I, I made in my presentation, that that um, it, uh, the pandemic has done enormous harm, especially to uh, less advantaged communities around the world, enormous suffering and hardship. But uh, but it it has had this very salutary impact in the sense of uh, showing people, giving people a kind of uh, a, a foretaste, a prelude, if you want, of of what might be coming in the future if we don't start don't start dealing with these underlying challenges and stresses identified, uh, and the reality of nonlinear flips and systems, how everything that we rely upon can change in just a week, as it did in March last year. And that the fact that we fundamentally need each other to, to, uh, uh, to have humane and prosperous lives, that we need to pull together to solve our problems. I mean, that's been the debate, hasn't it? For, for all through this pandemic, it's to what extent are we responsible for each other's well-being? And what I think is really interesting is, it, it, except for a minority of people who refuse to wear masks and object to restraints, majority of people have said, okay, yeah, we need to pull together to protect the weaker communities, the older people in our community who are particularly vulnerable and susceptible to this. And around the world, uh, uh, the, the response, I think, has been remarkably constructive for the most part, lots of failures, lots of objections to, to that general statement are possible. But but uh, uh, I think that it's been a very, it's been a very harsh reminder of our interdependence, of our dependence on each other, on our of our dependence on effective government, of the importance of scientific knowledge uh, and, uh, and scientific expertise in uh, protecting us against these threats. U ultimately, all of these, are very positive outcomes, I think, for dealing with challenges such as climate change. So uh, just this is going to combine two questions. Uh, Sepper Furshani asks a question. She says, uh, in your earlier work, you have studied the relation between connectivity and resilience, which is in some sense what you were just reflecting on. How has the pandemic changed your views on that relation, if at all? And what are the implications for the HOPE project? Now, the thing I think it would be interesting for you to bear in mind in this um, response would be, how we might uh, regulate social media in response to this, some of the concerns around hyperconnectivity. Yeah, yeah. Well, part of my answer would be just to just to go back to what I said before about uh, what I see emerging as kind of a, analogous to a global immune system in response to the coronavirus, mm -hmm. uh, and and the commitments that that will involve to international organizations, to the distribution of scientific expertise around the world, uh, to rapid response in terms of developing vaccines, to delivering them to wherever wherever the new variants have arisen. I, I could see that this kind of system could arise over the next few years, kind of a global vaccine. Uh, and variant observatory uh, that could be a precursor to distributed ways of solving other, other challenges we face. The, the social media problem, boy. So one of the big, there are a couple of things that I got wrong in The Upside of Down, which is my book in 2000, 2000, uh, 2006. Uh, and, and one was the possibility for what I called collective intelligence. Everybody thought in those days that if you wire everybody together, that somehow there'll be this emergent intelligence across our societies and around the world. And we'll, and that emergent intelligence will, will allow us to solve our problems much more effectively. Uh, and, and, and I think the, the, the sort of decompression of that aspiration, the, the loss of that, that vision has been really remarkable over the last 15 years or so, especially uh, during the period of time uh, of the rise of Donald Trump. And, what, and, and as we saw the pernicious effect of social media, the echo chamber effects of media over the last few years. So um, what I call this, one of the components of this challenge is what I call epistemic fragmentation, a kind of a kind of unraveling of a common commitment to facts, some shared facts and shared understanding of reality that people, communities are developing their own sense of what reality is. They have their own experts, they have their own journals, they have their, their own sources of, of knowledge, and they wall themselves off within social media communities from from. Uh, conversation with others. And so you, you lose this, this understanding of shared fact and conversations around values surrounding those shared facts that are essential to democratic practice. 
uh, democratic conversation around solving problems like climate change. Uh, so just very quickly, I, I had a I had a, a, a long conversation with Jim Balsilli about this uh, right in January last year. And he said, you have to put this in your book. He was almost he was shaking me by my lapels. Jim Balsilli is the former founder of research, one of the, the co-CEO of Research in Motion, BlackBerry fame. And he's become an, deeply concerned about these phenomena and the way that certain, certain uh, mega corporations exploit human psychology, try to find that sweet spot in human psychology of creating status anxiety and other phenomena to keep people coming back. And over time, these communities, as we've seen, can become more, more and more radicalized and, and more walled off from other communities. I don't have, but that's, that's kind of an analysis. I can go on at length about it. There are a number of components to it, but I don't have a clear answer to this challenge. It is phenomenally difficult. Uh, and and, uh, and it, it's very threatening. I mean, we, we, there's no, no possibility that we define broadly humanity is going to solve the climate change problem unless we agree that it's a problem and we have some basic understanding of what's happening, you know? And uh, so, so, uh, uh, all I say is, all I can say on this particular thing, this the social media issue is watch this space. And I don't think there are very many really good answers out there right now. It's just, it's a staggeringly serious situation. What we've got is collective disintelligence. We've got collective stupidity, not collective intelligence. Exactly the opposite of what we expected was going to happen with this kind of uh, internet connectivity among us. And yet people will still shoot for that 5% or 20% chance of, of pulling it out of the fire. So um, I, one of the things I noticed, that, you know, I, I, the distributed responses are a big part of complexity. I talked about this distributed response at the global, global level and dealing with the variants that are emerging. One of the things that has, you know, has ramped up, and I have actually been a little bit involved in this, just a very quick anecdote, uh, over the last few years is a kind of immune response to falsification, to nonsense. Now, it's not strong and, and maybe ultimately it won't be effective enough but nonetheless you know there, there's this meme out there that 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 uh, that it's got my name attached to it it's a misquote a misattribution uh, of a statement i supposedly made about the the ineffectiveness of wind power the, the fact that wind turbines don't generate enough energy to actually pay for the energy that went into making wind turbines and it's everywhere and it comes up yeah, you know, in, all, in the conversations, for instance, with uh, Governor Abbott in Texas, with President Trump, when he criticizes wind power, and there's this big burst of this meme with this poster with my name on it circulating everywhere. And it's been happening for about five or six years. And uh, in the first, it was out there being distributed everywhere, and nobody was really paying attention. What I've noticed in the last last year or so, or a few months, is that is there's a much more robust system of people around the world, Snopes and others, who are who are engaged in, in tracking down what's actually true, what's factually grounded, and then getting it out to a larger audience. How effective this is, I don't know ultimately, but it is what you might call a kind of immune system response to uh, uh, false falsity. And that's the way we're going to have to deal with a lot of our problems in, in the future, highly distributed network-based systems of response. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Tad. That was a wonderful talk and a great conversation. So the conversation continues um, March 16th when with all of the panelists or all of, all of the, uh, the speakers in the, in the series. But it also, it, the, the final speaker is on Thursday morning at 11 o'clock. I think we have, a, we have a poster to show. So values are the new religion. Uh, Linda Woodhead is the, is the featured speaker. She's a major figure in the, in the study of religion, but also sociology. And she also has a great deal to say about precisely this question of values or the new religion. So please join us for that. Again, it's this Thursday, two days at 11 o'clock. Please register for that. And then join us again when uh, Tad and Linda and Noam Chomsky and Nessia Dujian and Miroslav Volf will return for a, a larger uh, panel discussion of uh, all the themes that have emerged in the last uh, few months. So thanks again to, to Thomas Homer Dixon, to Britt Ray, to Lisa Kretz, and to Katie Stockdale for joining us today, and also for Ian Alexander, all of our friends, the diocese, for helping to make these events such a rewarding experience for all of us. Thanks, everybody, and have a good rest of your week. See many of you on Thursday, I hope.